I'm Mike Lyons, your host for another oral history interview for the Jacksonville Broadcasters Association. The association's purpose is to preserve the rich history and contributions of the area's radio, television, and broadcasting industries. The association is open to those past and present broadcasters and those affiliated with the region's broadcasting industry and entities who have served this region's proud broadcasting heritage. We welcome students who are focusing their careers on the broadcasting industry. Today is March 17, 2022. Our guest today is former assignment manager at WJKS Channel 17, newly retired operations manager and web manager from WJXT Channel 4, Steve Patrick. Hi. Steve, good to have you with us here today. Good to see you again, Mike. All right. So you went to Terry Parker, graduated in 72, a proud brave. What led you to media and broadcasting? Do you have interest in that in high school, I guess? Uh, I did. Um, when I was a teenager, I got interested in media. Of course, you know, in the late 60s, there was a lot of news going on, nationally mostly, and I was fascinated with political conventions and the protests and war going on and whatever. Um, and so I got an interest in, in media, and then in high school, joined the yearbook staff first and then the new school newspaper and by my senior year I was editor of the Terry Parker newspaper. So that sort of started that ball rolling and I got a job at the Times Union part time just to make some money. Um, and I wasn't in the newsroom, I was in like ad services and paste up and the, you know, putting the paper together. Mm -hmm. um, but it kept my appetite whetted for being in the news business. Mm -hmm. Then you began, I guess you worked for other print publications and we could take and actually writing for those and taking pictures for those photographers. Right. Yeah, I actually, because I started in a yearbook uh, environment, mm -hmm. I took pictures. That was actually my introduction. Mm -hmm. First time I ever had a p published picture in a media organization, it was in a community newspaper. I did high school sports, shooting football, high school football yeah. games from the sidelines and stuff. Um, so I sort of got the bug. Um, and while I was supporting myself going through college, I worked at the Times Union and then did some side projects with some of my high school buddies that we did a, our own little newspaper, um, tabloid entertainment community issue kind of right. thing, way back in the mid 70s, uh, and just kept my hand in it. And then because I had a comfortable job in the print side, I just kept doing that um, until cable television came to town and they offered you the opportunity to just go in and use their equipment to produce TV shows mm. for free and right. put them on. Yeah. Public Whatever. access cable. Public access you know, cable. You used to yeah. make fun of it on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> yeah. But we were doing more than the interviews with the potted plant, which is sort of <laughs> what this feels like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no potted plant. Yeah. But um, we took cameras out and to local venues and were shooting bands playing and we sort of doing simple rudimentary music videos mm -hmm. uh, back before MTV was on and was, became a network. Um, and then I started doing sort of like quasi documentaries on the environmental movement because Earth Day was brand new back yeah. then. Right. Um, and taught myself enough that I said, this is actually more interesting than print because as a photographer, which is what I probably had the credentials to get a job as, at a newspaper, you like you can have a picture, you cannot have a picture. It's kind of helpful, but it's not necessary. In television, it's rudimentary. I mean, you got to have the pictures and the sound and the editing, and that actually is equally, if not more important, than what the reporters say. Right. So I was fascinated by that, um, and I got a job at Channel 17 back in '83. Um, when they were, you know, solid number three station, the station was for sale. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any money, uh, and they were desperate enough to fill a photographer job with somebody that had no broadcast experience. Right. So, that's but you were right. doing news on television without working at a television yeah. news station, and you did it on your own. You used the term self-taught. Yeah. To to me, on a couple of times we were talking, self-taught. You yep. taught yourself how to shoot and do all that. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I self-taught myself stills and then I self-taught myself uh, television um, and I, I loved it. And then once I got into it, 
Um, I continued to learn. I was very active with the National News Photographers Association mm -hmm. um, and participated in several of their trainings. Went to Pointer Institute mm -hmm. in St. Pete, which is a photojournalism, well, it's a journalism mm -hmm. training think tank. Did you walk into the cable TV station and pick up a camera and somebody show you how to use it at least? Or? Yeah, yeah, they had some. There was a, there was a person <laughs> whose job was to help the community members mm -hmm. use this stuff. Use it. So, they, so yeah, I had a little bit of instruction, but it was all self-motivated that I actually did it. Yeah. How did the transition come from doing it yourself at local cable into into Channel 17? Um, well, it was it was actually great. I mean, it was uh, the first time in my life I ever got paid to do what I loved, which was storytelling through photography, which yeah. in this case was you know video. Um, and I was very happy. In fact, being a news photographer was one of the happiest times of my <laughs> professional life. Really? Yeah. I, I know I always said that if I was going to be one thing, it would be that because I enjoyed it, the photography. When you get that shot that, that's just neat or nobody else has. It's, right. And then you some... edit together that sequence that really conveys an emotion right. or tells the story. It's right. like, it's great. Right. Now, you, when you came to 17, it was 83. And you told me what, Burt Rosell and Karen Bowling yep. were the anchors. Yep. And they were, what, doing a 530 News at the time. And that was 530 different. 530 and 11, because they didn't want to compete head to head uh, mm -hmm. against, you know, 4 and 12, because they, they were the big dogs. Mm -hmm. um, and the station eventually was bought by Media General. And you were there at the <laughs> yeah. time, uh, and it got better. Media General pumped in some money, and we got live trucks and satellite truck and a helicopter over the over the years, over a period of ten right. years. Um, and it got better and more competitive, and to the point where, you know, we were actually number two, um, competing for number two against twelve pretty closely until there was an affiliation right. swap, and. Because we, you know, we yeah. were NBC and we kind of went up with the Bill Cosby show and yeah. whatever other good shows they had on yeah. there and just it went yeah. up. And it started as ABC yeah, right. when I was hired. Yeah, right. They went to NBC. See, right. And then they then uh, when they got uh, Gannett, I guess, bought 12 yeah. and yeah. leveraged them to get right. NBC back. Yeah. And once that happened... Gannett was smart and marketed the affiliation change really well, and 17 sort of laid back and said it'll take care of itself. And <laughs> yeah. It didn't, and the station, <laughs> right. I mean, they continue to do good work, um, but, but that the showed ratings you, dropped. Right. It showed me the strength of a network connection. Mm -hmm. when, when 17 was with NBC, and NBC was so strong, they were the dominant network, right. number one on entertainment, and it really re helped reflect in the ratings of Channel 17's local stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, especially when you're sort of a startup. I mean, they've been doing news for a decade, but they were kind <laughs> right. of a startup in the sense that most people weren't familiar with their news. So, you know, if you have it on the station, you're watching for something else at, at 1059, you know, you're probably not going to get up and change the channel right. to see what the lead story at 11 is. So. I think St. Elsewhere was one of those shows, the hustle yeah. shows back back in the day there on NBC. Oh, yeah. The NBC was really strong back <laughs> yeah, then. Right. And and. Uh, that was before Seinfeld and all that stuff. But, yeah. yeah. Satellite network. You talked about that satellite trucks that, that you were in on that. That kind of had to be different. That was fun. Right. Yeah. Um, they actually sent me to Minneapolis, St. Paul to learn how to operate a satellite truck and be part of a networks of SNG. Mm -hmm. So you, we could do reports for from anywhere for us. And then there was a network of where the local affiliates would do a story. For, if something big happened here, we'd do it for stations around the country, right. and they do the same thing for us. So you sort of had your little mini networks forming, mm -hmm. um, and that that was a lot of fun. Um, and I liked that kind of news because typically if it's something you sent the satellite truck to, it was a pretty good story. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was either really significant right. or really interesting, right. um, or they weren't going to spend the money to send a satellite truck and buy satellite. And satellite time was like 15 bucks per, <laughs> you know, a minute. <laughs> And it's like, and you had to feed tape and buy a 10-minute block yeah, to so do your yeah. live shots. And it's like, you weren't going to do that unless it was something it's significant. significant. Right. Talk about the news helicopter. 17 eventually got a news helicopter. Yep. First one in the market ever by anybody. And yep. you would figure it might be with the bigger new house operations, but it wasn't. But that, that was kind of new and exciting and yeah. different. Yeah. Um, and they could live track. They had a, a little microwave and a bell underneath it and the station could track it and pick it up live as it flew. Right. 
Um, and we, again, Media General was pumping money into the station trying to make a difference and, and take this little number three into a significant station. And that's one of the things they did. And it was an expensive venture, but they used it well. And uh, I think that's one of the things that, that propelled growth. Um, and you get a perspective and you get an immediacy. I mean, if something is, is a big fire in McClenny, you can be there in 15 yeah, minutes right. with live pictures. Right, right. Do you recall the most interesting or best or exciting story you did with the helicopter? Do you recall that at all? Um, there were so many. There were so many that were just, you know, live over a traffic accident. It was the right. like, stupid little stuff. Um, I don't. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it was just the thing I remember most about being in the helicopter is when you're a photographer and you're doing live shots in the field, generally you don't hear the newscast other than maybe right before you go live when you're right. plugged into IFB and listening for cues. But when you're in a helicopter, you're sitting in a seat and you've got a monitor in front of you on the station yeah. and you're listening to it. So from the time you lift off to the time you sit down, right. you've got, you're listening to your news. Right. So you get to see the entire newscast. So that was different because usually when you're in the field as a photographer, you just saw your one little segment right. and that was it. My most memorable thing was we had to go to a, a execution at the prison. Yeah, it's dark. Flew, flew over there, didn't take very long at all, but we flew over. They granted us permission to fly over Cecil Field. Mm -hmm. There was nothing out there. Yeah. And when they closed Cecil Field right. and sent all those planes up to where everybody is, I thought, I thought that was crazy because of what I was able to see yeah. from the air. Cecil Field, that area, was the air base and nothing. Yeah. For as far as you could see. Yep. <laughs> it was incredible. Your viewpoint from that was just amazing. That's and being seeing Jacksonville from that helicopter was neat, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, and flying <laughs> over the river, those beauty shots. I mean, uh, huge, you know, big forest fires, um, that sort of thing, and going up in the aftermath of a tropical storm and seeing the, the erosion on the beach. It's just a perspective that you can't get any other way. Of course, now you have drones, which in some ways are better visually because you're closer to the ground. Right. But uh, back then, that was, and the fact that you could be live from the air uh, quicker than you could get there on the ground was right. amazing. You mentioned that you just love being a photographer. What's the most exciting thing or the best thing about being the TV news photographer? Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's the best and the worst of life is what you get to see. I mean, I, I joked that I saw more rooftops of the city than I knew existed because, you know, you went up on, yeah. you know, the Independent right. Life Building, what right. it was at the time, and then yeah. it was MODIS, and now it's <laughs> whatever. Um, but um, being at, like, acceptance speeches, I remember Jake Godbold's, you know, party when he won the second term as, as mayor, and being in that party and feeling the excitement, mm -hmm. and you just, you get to meet all these important people as a, as a you know, and you're sort of like an accessory because they don't really pay much attention to the camera guy, but you're you're in the room where it happens. Sort of now yeah. we're here from Hamilton, right. um, and then you have you know memorable but unpleasant experiences, like when you know you're shooting a jailwalk of somebody accused of killing a family of three, and he spits at you. You know, oh, so <laughs> yeah. it's like the best and the worst. It was of time. tiny, was it? <laughs> tiny Davis. Yeah. Yep. I followed his from the night that they found the bodies till that he was executed. Amazing, I can remember that name, yeah, but yeah, that was a big, big case. You eventually became the assignment editor at Channel 17, yeah. and that's a whole different gig, a whole different thing. How did that happen? Explain to people what that job is, how different that is from what you were doing. Well, yeah, I mean, you're no longer in the field, you're no longer in the room where it happened, you're in the room where the decisions are made about sending crews. Right. Um, they asked me to do that. Um, and the first time they asked me, I didn't want to do it because I was enjoying being a news photographer so much. Um, but then I was blessed in one year. Um, I won an Emmy uh, for covering Hurricane Elena. Um, I went to Germany to work on a documentary about uh, National Guard, Florida National Guard training in oh. Europe. And I went to Vancouver did a story about Ramsey's two before it was going to come to oh, Jacksonville. Yeah, yeah. It was Remember a big that. deal. Um, and so I traveled out of the country twice and won an Emmy. 
and in one year and I said I probably won't have a whole lot more years like this so and then when they offered me at the job again I said okay well I'll take it it was a promotion it was basically running the news operation with in consult with the news director and executive producer mm -hmm. or whatever but here's what we're covering and the assignment desk job is sort of keeping a pulse on what's happening in the community and filtering tips and setting up things with you know news sources um, but it's also a lot of logistics of just pairing up reporters, photographers, how long it's going to take to get there, how many stories could somebody do in a day, making sure, you know, that they got what they need to get the job done. And getting an engineer with a satellite truck there too, right? Right. Yeah, and and it's, so it's a lot of logistics and I was pretty good at that. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, it worked out pretty well. Uh, a story about that, I was going to be, become, uh, assignment editor on Monday and this Sunday, the USS Stark was hit by missiles oh, in Iraq. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, it was a Mayport-based ship. Yeah. And so Sunday night, you know, the networks are calling, saying, what are you doing at Mayport? You know, they want live shots and coverage of the people back home. Right. Um, and we were scrambling. We're a small station. We're scrambling to cover it for ourselves. That that week, you know, network crews were coming in by... I think it was Friday, uh, President Reagan was here given a memorial at Mayport for the, the lost oh, yeah. lives. Uh, and it was actually, you know, it was a very, very, very intense. And I was brand new in the job. But at the end of that week, you know what? I kind of relaxed and said, if I can get through this, I can get through anything. <laughs> And so it was really good for me. It's amazing the last five minutes, the big stories that you've mentioned we've talked about. Right. It's incredible. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just, oh, and that was just at 17. <laughs> <or> just <talking laughs> that was at 17. About, yeah, that bit? was back 30 right, years right, ago. Right. Yeah. Okay, then I guess it was 87, you tra you, you yeah. transitioned to Channel 4, WJXT, right. TV4. Yep. The, not the small number three, but the big time number one. That, that yeah. I, how did you transition to that? What, and what did you do there? Um, I started looking for a job because the assignment desk is kind of a thankless job. Um, and 17, we mentioned the affiliation swap and it, NBC went back to 12 and, and the writing was on the wall that we would probably never be anything other than a number three station. Right. Um, no matter how hard we tried and, and we were doing good work. But it just great, great station, though. Great people. Great oh, people. Yeah, it was, it. Well, Everybody it was, that ever worked there said great people. It's a great absolutely. place to work. It, and it was such a good training ground for all of us, um, no matter where we ended up. Hogan Road School of Broadcasting. Absolutely. <laughs> Which um, I came up with. Well, good. You know oh, I thought yeah. that was Glenn Fisher. No, okay, no I did that. That was me. All right. Yeah. Um, HRSOB, you know. That was great. <laughs> That's yeah. a good line. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and, and I still have, I mean, I'm Facebook friends with 20 people <laughs> from 30 years ago that I worked with back right, then. Right, right. Um, some good friends still. Uh, but yeah, um, I wanted to do more than be on an assignment desk. Um, I had no, I mean, look at me and hear, hear my voice. I'm not going to be on TV, which oh. is where a lot of the real money is if you're at a small <laughs> station. Um, so I decided to start looking around and seeing what else was out there, and I applied at several stations around the country. I got some interest, but uh, Channel 4 was interested in hiring me as a job called News Operations Manager, which we didn't have at 17. It was too, too small a station. Mm -hmm. And it was a combination of chief photographer and um, news manager that I sort of was their backup assignment desk, but I was really their manage the photographers, the editors, uh, the scheduling, the budgets, the live trucks, the com cameras, the fleet of vehicles. Were you back to shooting? Did you also? Um, I, I occasionally just... shot, I, I sort of operated, I wasn't shooting on a regular basis like a chief photographer would, but when they had like a big story that they wanted an extra person to go, um, you know, especially an out-of-town trip, I would go as kind of like a coordinator, field producer, shooter, editor, because I could fill in. Because when you got, you know, crews in the field that are constantly turning around stories, it's good to have somebody that, like, I could finish up editing, they could go shoot something else. Right. Um, so I did get in the field sometimes. So you grabbed this that. equipment you were yeah. looking over, and you got right. you a set, and you took off and yeah. 
helped. So do it. yeah, and again, that was kind of neat because it was usually the big story. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was either an out of town trip or a big story. So that was good. Um, and I did that for a while. Um, I grew a lot in that job because Channel Four expanded shortly after I got there. Um, well, not shortly, but a few years after I got there, they went independent. They lost the CBS affiliate or they gave it up. Gave it they, up. they yeah. turned, yeah. Yeah. they said, no CBS, we're not going to pay you to carry programming you're making money off of from the commercials that we're broadcasting. Right. That was an incredible, that in TV history in Jacksonville, yeah. that was kind of an incredible uh, move that they made it and was. kind of a shocking move, but yeah. in reality it turned out to be no problem. Well, <laughs> it took a, it, it was a bumpy road Real for a couple of years right. um, because most of the conventional wisdom is you're going to lose ratings if you don't have a network. Right. That's um, what we refer to with the NBC bringing right. up 17. Right. You don't have that anymore. And most stations right. couldn't pull that off. If you weren't a dominant number one station, if you don't have a network to get your viewers, you're not going to make it. But Channel 4 was one of those stations, the handful in the country that, that have made that transition successfully, given up their network and still kept an audience. Um, the advertisers and you know, even community leaders, they thought that we would probably not recover from that. And that hurt because a lot of the advertisers didn't want to place ads with us. They were convinced the ratings were going down. Right. And the ratings, at least for news, held right. um, yeah. because it was a great station. They had good people and um, it was it was the number one go-to yeah. for news. I remember hearing at one time that Channel 4 was one of the most dominant news rating, news rating stations in the country. I mean, like in the... Yeah top five in the country as far as their their rating share in a for, market. For, right. We were a smaller market comparatively. Yeah, right. But yeah, for our share of the of the ratings, I mean it was it was ridiculous back then. I mean forty percent of the people watching television, sometimes more, at, at a given time, are watching Channel Four. And the others are split between 17 and 12, and at that time, 30 had come on, and 7 and whatever right. else. What was that happen. like going to a, from 17, the 3 to the 1, and being in a number strong number 1 like that? What was that it like was, to you? It was uh, shocking. It, was, it felt like going to a major market because they just did things differently. They did things bigger. Right. You um, stayed in Jacksonville, but went to a major right. market In fact, I, I tell people, it's fine and funny, because I worked for ABC, NBC, and CBS, and, and an independent station, all in Jacksonville. <laughs> um, and I worked for probably 12 news directors and eight general managers, all in Jacksonville. <laughs> you know, So most people in this business, they just keep moving to a different market and different environment. I, I stayed in one place and sort of, things moved around me. And, and good, strong, talented yeah. people that you learn from there. Absolutely. Yeah. So an example of that is um, like 10 days after I started there, Hurricane Hugo was coming up the coast. If you remember, Hugo was the one that devastated Charleston. Right. I was in the middle of it, right? Smack in the middle of yep. it overnight. Couldn't yep. see the hand in front of my face, but I remember that. So that's coming. And the station, like, they convene a meeting. And it wasn't like news managers in the news conference room. It's like, this is the, the GM calls the meeting. And the sales manager and the business manager and HR and everybody's up there um, figuring out how the station's going to deal with it. Because at Channel 4, more so than any place else I've ever noticed, it's a stationwide effort. I mean, the there's a phone bank that's manned by... The people, the second floor people, the, the business and the salespeople manage the, the phones and they will bring in food and they'll do, they'll do support operations for the news people so the news people can work their 12 hour shifts and, and cover this hurricane. So it was just a totally different environment. So I'm meeting all these station managers for the first time at a meeting planning how we're going to cover Hurricane Hugo. Right. And of course, I'm kind of the point guy because it's like, well, where are you going to put crews and what trucks are you using? It's right. like, okay. That's your job. Yeah. <laughs> So it was uh, it was just a different experience, and it up up my level of competency. And then the point I was going to make is when we lost CBS or gave up CBS, um, and we still had Oprah and we had news, so we had some core programming right. that we knew people were going to watch. Um, but they expanded from everybody had a six o'clock news except seventeen, and actually seventeen had eventually gone to six o'clock as well. So we needed more programming. So they went from five-minute cut-ins in the morning 
to a two and later three and later four hour morning show. Right. Um, they added a five and 5.30 p.m. half hour sure. and they just needed content for that. So 6.30, they did their own kind of uh, They did national their show 6.30 news and, national and they did a 10. I mean, the 10 and 11 were kind of traditional newscast right. and they could sort of fill that. But right. the five and 5.30 and the morning show, they kind of, they kind of like between rehashing the night before, right. having an overnight right. reporter and national news, they could fill that. But five and 5.30 p.m. was like this new creature for them. Yeah. And like, how are we going to fill this? So they came up with all these concept lifestyle kind of things. Mm -hmm. And so I got tasked with being the field producer for like movie reviews and consumer <laughs> segments and all this other stuff to fill all of all this, this time. Right. So that was really a stretch. I worked with Arthur Crofton mm -hmm. on, the, on the, a lot of those segments. Right. Um, the consumer segments would go out at the Jacksonville Landing and have three products blind taste test and see what people liked and oh, okay. all that stuff. So <laughs> had like, we had plenty of time and plenty of opportunities yeah, to do so. Yeah, so that was, that was a totally new experience for me. Right. Now you got into computer systems then? Yeah, into Telephone computer was com com computer network. Uh, right. um, it, the computerized newsroom, which is now you know normal, everybody has. And that was self-taught. You use that term again, self-taught. Right. You learned um, that? I had taken some off-the-shelf software and computerized the assignment desk at Channel 17. That was one of the things that caught the eye of Channel 4 managers that got me this job. I'd been in, you know, managing photographers and all that stuff, and I, assignment desk credentials were good. But I taught myself computer knowledge enough to run the assignment desk and have computerized tracking of everything we were doing. So they said, oh, that's good enough. They were completely had a computerized newsroom. So I had to learn that system and become yeah. the, administer, the administrator yeah, right, right. of that and sign people on and off, and I was the help desk and all that stuff. So, uh, many years later, um, when the websites came along, mid-90s, this thing called the World Wide Web started existing, and we were starting to use it for research on stories because governments and universities at the, early on were where <laughs> most of the content was published, but that was good research material for us. And after a year or so, we said, we should be a provider of information, not just somebody using it like everybody else. And so the station gave me the green light to develop a website. And so Which was the first in the website then was what? WJXT.com. Right. Uh, 95, late 95 we went on. Um, which was really early for a local TV station to have a website. We were the first in town. We, and you told we me beat so, the Times Union yeah, with a website. And it was a little, um, I don't know what the word would be, pretty simple. Uh, yeah. You used the word no ads and no videos. Right. I mean, it was a very, I mean, it was low tech for yeah. sure. I mean, it was text and still pictures. Um, and we, because we're news people, we made a commitment to update it twice a day. First, uh, we did it morning and evening, um, but we didn't try to do updates throughout the day. I mm -hmm. mean, literally, we did an update in the morning to update in the right. evening. And then as it grew and the audience grew, we started doing more. We hired a part-timer and then we hired another part-timer to help me because I was still doing the news operations job, mm -hmm. run this thing. And then in um, late 1900s, coming up on 2000, Corporate, we were owned by uh, Washington Post at the time, decided that this web thing was going to be part of the future <laughs> yeah. and we better get on board with it. So they developed a corporate strategy and I was part of the team that worked with them. We talked to the Washington Post about their online division doing something to help the stations, but they ended up um, outsourcing it basically. The company bought a share of an internet startup called Internet Broadcasting Systems that specialized in helping TV stations get online. Well, we were on, already online, but again, it was really simple. We couldn't make any money because we had no ads. Right. We weren't showing video. We're a TV station, and they right. knew that we needed to advance right. this. So we went on in the summer of in August of 2000 with newsforjax.com. Right. So five years after we had a website, we became a real rich website right. with ads, video, interactive features, a staff that constantly updated right. it seven days a week. That had to be exciting, get your adrenaline going, being yep. on the ground floor of the website construction. Yep. I mean, you... That, well, that the best had... part was I had gotten to the point where 
news operations was a lot of managing the equipment and the fleet mm -hmm. and the schedules and the budgets. And now it was back doing news because I was supervising a staff of people who, I mean, there was some technology involved, but primarily we were getting news out to people on a new platform. As soon as you could. As soon as we as could. As could. Yeah. yeah. And that's what now, that's the world we live in. I mean, <laughs> right. the phone goes off and it's like something just happened. And, and boom, there's a web story in a right. minute or two or however long. <laughs> right. And so that's that's the goal is to, you know, still be accurate, but be really, really, really fast. Well, I guess a lot of travel and learning, too, for you to learn how to do this and, and yeah. to work with these other things. That had to yeah. be fun, too. Again, there was some training in yeah. Minneapolis-St. Paul, which is what <laughs> Internet broadcasting was. Right. Um, so went up there a few times. And then uh, later on, that company was absorbed in Nexstar which they focus more on their own owned TV stations. So um, Graham created a digital. At that point, Washington Post was sold to Jeff Bezos, yeah. and we were no longer owned by the Washington Post because that was its own thing under Amazon ownership. Um, so the Graham Media was created to own the television stations, and they created a digital staff. So working with them, uh, in Detroit, so went up to Detroit a bunch of times, and um, I was their first manager, web managing editor when uh, the corporate went to these owned websites, these corporate websites. I was the first station uh, web manager, and there's been a lot of turnover, and when I retired, I was the last of the people from 2000 that launched their websites. Wow. So yeah. everybody else had already turned And over. that website was really popular in Jacksonville, Florida. It still it is. Was, it still is. <laughs> it was big time. But why, why do you think that was? Um, part of it's early. We were the first. Part of it's affiliation with Channel 4, which is the dominant TV station. So um, Bob Ellis, our general manager, a lot of the time that I was at Channel 4 and recently left also, um, he called TV the biggest megaphone. And we had a big megaphone that was promoting our website. So that was a big part of it. But honestly, it was, if you, and I'm biased for sure, but if you looked at the web stories of the websites out there, local news websites, we had by far the most comprehensive, well-presented, well-edited news stories on our website, other than the Times Union. I got to give them credit because they do a really good job, but they don't do as much and typically not as quickly. And no video. <laughs> uh, actually, now they're doing video because yeah, their photographers when they first are multitasking started, but what, again. But, but you were doing videos long, long before that. Yeah, then. right. So, but you had to be proud of that. I mean, you said, that is mine yeah. and that's big time. It is. <laughs> and, you know, we won Best Website in Florida from the Associated Press virtually every year. We came in second a couple times uh, for 20 years. Uh, we won a couple of regionals and a national award for our website, and it, it felt really good. Right, and there was a big difference between it and then when you retired than when it first started. Oh, it was night and day. <laughs> I mean, it's like you know, driving a you know a Tesla today versus a Corvair, you know, when it first started driving. So. Right, incredible. Um, you saw Jacksonville, Florida. You're from here, yeah. and we're now. No, I'm work, actually not. Uh, on, oh, I'm from oh, Indiana. Oh, oh, which moved okay. here in high school. High school. Okay. Right. So since but, my teens, right. I've been here. But you saw Jacksonville in the media develop over 40 years. How, how would you describe the evolution of Jacksonville in your time broadcasting? in the broadcasting business here in Jacksonville? Uh, night and day. <laughs> I mean, uh, there was always, it was always an interesting place to live and a beautiful place to live and good people. Um, it's just, it's grown into a, it feels like a major city even though we don't have some major city problems, but it's big enough that yeah. um, lots of things happen here, lots of opportunity here. Um, the skyline's grown, the venues for entertainment and education and everything else have grown. You got the beaches and the river too. That's oh yeah, I mean it's just, it's, it's, the, I, it's a hidden, I mean it's not hidden much anymore. Yeah. But, um, and, and they say it's going to triple in population in the next 20 or 30 right. years. I hope that doesn't happen right. really, but um, it's, it's a great place to live and, and it's, uh, there's enough going on here. It's like 
remember I said was talking about the having to create content for that five and five thirty. We learned really quickly we didn't have to. There was enough going on in town that we didn't have to manufacture content. I mean, there was a lot to cover, and you know, just it was a manage of, of getting enough staff and time to go out and cover people because there's always things happening, right. good and bad. Right. Uh, unfortunately, the media focuses a lot on you know b- right. bad news and crime and whatever, but. Um, that's one of the things that having more time gave you was the ability to cover some of the good things and people profiles and other things. Mm-hmm. And the other nice thing about when we went to the web is there's no limit. So what we tried to do was take, teach the reporters that you know the stuff that normally gets left out of your minute and a half story, if you got really good stuff, you know, give it to us. We'll put it, you know, in text form in the story, or you could do like extra video. Yeah. We, you know, put on a lot of long form interviews, interviews yeah. with people. So okay, we could only right. use we were two sound bites. 50, yeah, two sound bites, fifteen seconds a piece, if that. Right. That's all you could use. So, but if it was a really compelling interview or an entire speech of significance or whatever, we digitize the whole thing and, and put it on the website. So. Right. Doesn't happen often in this business, but being able to work in one place in Jacksonville, where you graduated for the yeah. whole time, that had I'm to be blessed. a big I'm plus. Absolutely, big Very plus. Blessed. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, can't couldn't have asked for more. What would you say to young people that were interested in a, a career in broadcasting? What would you say to them? First of all, don't limit yourself to thinking it's broadcasting. Um, unless your definition of that is really broad. Um, because nowadays, the digital side of the business is as big, or will soon be as big. Um, it's lagging behind in revenue, but in audience reach, the digital side is as big or bigger. Right. Ken Thomas, a professor of communications here at UNF, and now president of the Jacksonville right. Broadcast Association, tells me all the time, there's a lot more jobs in broadcasting then they're just reporting on the six o'clock news or shooting the story. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And if you want a job as a reporter on camera, which unfortunately is what seems like most of the people in communication schools want to do, is like you've got to hard road. Um, you got to start in a tiny market, unless you're really lucky and know somebody. You got to start right. in a tiny market. And remember, I talked about how much I love photography. There's really no reporting jobs in small markets. It's a MMJ, multimedia journalist, where you're shooting, editing, and reporting. I know all about it. Yep. <laughs> and you did sports, and that's what sports has always been that way, really. Yeah, right. I had started in that. Uh, yeah, when I became an MMJ later, I said, well, I did that already. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, but now that's basically, in a small market, that's the only thing that could exist. And even in this size, Jaswell market, medium market, there's probably most of the jobs now for on camera, at least at the starting level, you got to shoot and edit your own stuff, at least sometimes. I mean, sometimes it's breaking news and you're doing a live shot, you'll get a photographer, but you got to be prepared for picking up that camera and doing it yourself. Right. So, and you also need to feed the digital beast. Well, I was just going to say that that uh, near the end of my career, it was even, I joked with Roger Weeder, it was harder the last four years than the first four because you had digital. I had to do the web and digital too. Right. And, and, and Roger Goat, he said, no, it was harder the first, uh, the, harder than the first 24, <laughs> you know, because <what laughs> all they had. But right, the reporter who's right. shooting or on air has to know your business that you yeah. were doing there, the web, right? Yeah. I mean, they get at least the input side of it. <laughs> they got to get that story in. Um, and it's, it's kind of like one of, I think, the benefits that we had um, that made News for Jacks good was because you know, those of us that came up through the business knew how to do a lot of things and knew the importance of like when it is breaking news and you got to get a live report ready for the six o'clock broadcast and it's 515, I'm not going to expect you because I've been there. I'm not going to expect you to sit down and write a 10 graph web story because your priority is making slot for the six o'clock news. So we had an understanding that if you want to send me notes, if you're on deadline and you send me notes, that's good enough, and a still picture. Right. Um, and because I, I get it that the broadcast still pays most of the bills, the right. TV 
you know, advertising pays most of the bills at right. this point. And so you got to feed that, that beast first if you're on deadline. If you're not on deadline, if it's two o'clock in the afternoon and something happens and I don't have something from you by three, then that's not good. Right. Um, but, but if you, it's 5.15, you, right, right. I understand just right. send me what you got right. and work on the right. TV side. And your experience in writing yeah. that you've had for 40 years right. is you're able to right. take those notes and, and do a right. meaningful web right. story. And we have a staff, a digital staff now. Uh, we got a lot of people that are hybrids that do both. But we have, you know, on a good day, we have five, sometimes six people on the digital side that do nothing but, but rewrite, massage, post, add pictures, add video, and make what you send from the field better. Wow. Because, and the other thing you understand as a new student coming in is there's two styles. Broadcast style is a little different than, than web style. Right, right. Web is, uh, I got sort of slammed sometimes because they, you know, I called it print style. And it's really not because it's a little lighter and, you know, more compelling, more more personal than what we think of as newspaper yeah, style. Right. But it's different than broadcasting because broadcasting, the, the things that make broadcasting great are like great visuals, great natural sound, really good sound bites. Well, right. TV um, without pictures is radio. Yeah. <laughs> we heard that all absolutely. the time. <laughs> but in print, the things that make a really compelling print story are details. Details are boring on television. You round off right. numbers, you leave things right. out, partly for time, but partly because, you know, it's yeah. just a stream of conversation and you can't absorb too much detail. Mm -hmm. But on the web, detail is what makes the story rich and compelling and credible. It's like if you, you know, have exact numbers and cite your source, it's a better story. Whereas right. on television, it says that just bogs you down. Yeah, and I right. get that on television. It's just a different style, and I'm not criticizing right. television for it. It's just you got to understand that when you you can't just take your broadcast script and and make it pretty in upper and lower case and punctuation right. and put it on the web. It's just right. it's not a good web story. Right. You were and saying, that's what yeah. for a new student, it's hard to do both yeah. and do them well. Right. You said we have, uh, you know, you said we have, we have. You retired in, in the fall of 21. Okay, okay. it's only <laughs> been four months, Mike. Okay? No. Do you miss it? I mean. I miss it less than I thought I would. I mean, it's, you, you know what it's like being in a newsroom. It's very exciting and compelling and you want to be part of whatever's happening. And you can tell from my, you know, way I've talked about being involved in big stories. It's exciting and interesting and compelling. Um, and I thought I would miss it. Um, I actually have missed it less than I thought. I mean, just because retirement is a wonderful life, <laughs> getting your life back <laughs> yeah. because you are right. consumed by right. TV right. news, right. Um, by news in general, probably. Right. It's just because it's always something happening. Yeah. And the next big thing is always what you try to be involved with. And it's nice to just take a step back and watch it. No. Well, I appreciate you being here today. You've held a lot of great stories and you had a great 40 years here in Jacksonville and did all kind of things yeah. and, and helped create one of the best websites in the country. Thank Great. you, Mike. Thanks for being here. All right. Great. Thank you.